Welcome to the radio lecture for Mass Communication and Society or Mass Media and Society. Radio is a technology that allows the transmission of signals by modulating on the electromagnetic spectrum. It uses frequencies below that of light. Heinrich Hertz was a German physicist who died of blood poisoning at the age of 37. He was the first to prove that you could transmit and receive electric waves wirelessly. Although Hertz originally thought his work had no practical use, today it's recognized as the fundamental building block of radio and every frequency measurement is named after him, the Hertz. Nikolaus Tesla was a Serbian-American inventor who discovered the basis for most alternating current machinery. In 1884, a year after coming to the United States, he sold the patent rights for his system of alternating current dynamos, transformers, and motors to George Westinghouse. Then he established his own lab where he invented, among other things, the Tesla coil, an induction coil widely used in radio. This Canadian spent much of his working life in the U.S. where he developed a way to combine sound and radio carrier waves. His first effort to transmit this mixed signal to a receiver where the carrier wave would be removed and the listener could hear the original sound failed. However, in 1906, using Alexanderson's alternator, Fessenden made the first long-range transmission of a voice, Massachusetts. He developed a way to combine sound and radio carrier waves. When he made his first long-range transmission from Massachusetts, ships at sea heard a broadcast that included Fessenden playing the song, O Holy Night, on the violin, and then he read a passage from the Bible. This Italian creator spent most of his life in England, where he introduced many of the first uses of wireless telegraphy to European navvies. His radio apparatus is widely considered to be the reason that over 700 people survived the Titanic disaster in 1912, instead of dying as they likely would have if ships at sea were still using carrier pigeons to communicate over great distances. Lita Forrest is credited with being the father of American radio. DeForest was a direct competitor to Marconi at the turn of the century when he was the chief scientist at the United States' first radio firm, American Wireless Telephone and Telegraph, until Marconi took over the company's assets in 1912 after a series of financial scandals. Although he held 300 patents, DeForest's greatest technological contribution is considered to be his 1906 Audion vacuum tube, which made it easier to receive radio signals. The Audion was the first triode consisting of a partially evacuated glass tube containing three electrodes, a heated filament, a grid, and a plate. David Sarnoff's technical ability propelled him quickly through the ranks at Marconi, and in 1915, he submitted an idea for what he called a radio music box. This was a time when radio was used mainly in shipping by, and by amateur wireless enthusiasts. He believed his device would make radio a household utility like the piano or the phonograph. The idea to bring music into the house by wireless was his goal, as he wrote in a memo. He moved from the Marconi Company and later became the head of RCA. By then, he knew that radio would become a big business in America. Because of the success of Conrad, RCA, General Electric, and AT&T, with other small companies, started their own radio stations. Listening to the radio became a national fad. By 1930, radio had truly become the newest form of mass media. Radio stations linked into a network that helped save lots of money as all stations shared the cost of a single program and they broadcast it, which helped advertisers reach a much larger audience. 
The first network was NBC, or the National Broadcasting Company, that started in 1926. And the following year, CBS, or the Columbia Broadcast System, was created. By 1937, these networks each had over 100 stations. Big name entertainers, usually comedians, like Jack Benny and Ed Wynn were popular, but the most popular was the Amos and Andy Show, which were two white comedians in blackface. Wouldn't fly today, it would be considered far too racist. But back then it was the top rated show. In 1927, the government decided they needed to regulate airwaves in interests of people. This was in 1927 and was called the Radio Act, meaning stations could only broadcast on assigned frequencies at specified power levels and at scheduled times. This was replaced by the Federal Communications Act in 1934. The Federal Communications Commission was developed by President Theodore Roosevelt to create a government agency to consolidate regulatory functions of the communications industry. In response, Congress passed the Communications Act of 1934, still fit the fundamental philosophy of the original Radio Act of 1927. In 1933, Edwin Armstrong developed and patented a new radio signal that was static-free and carried higher and lower audio frequencies than AM. This was FM radio. It was the ideal carrier for music. During the Great Depression, one of the favorite radio shows was The Lone Ranger. On Halloween morning, 1938, Orson Welles awoke to find himself the most talked about man in America. The night before, Welles and his Mercury Theater on the Air had performed a radio adaptation of H.G. Welles's The War of the Worlds, converting the 40-year-old novel into fake news bulletins describing a Martian invasion of New Jersey. Some listeners mistook those bulletins for the real thing, and they sort of went into a panic. They called the police, they called newspaper offices, they called radio stations, and many convinced journalists that the show had actually caused nationwide hysteria. By the next morning, the 23-year-old Wells' face and name were on the front pages of newspapers coast to coast, along with headlines about the mass panic that his CBS broadcast had allegedly inspired. The infamous War of the World's radio broadcast was a magnificent fluke. Orson Welles and his colleagues scrambled to pull together the show, and they ended up writing pop culture history. During the Depression, Americans were very concerned for the future of their country. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the president at the time, and he developed what were called the fireside chats. He did these because he wanted people to feel like he was having a conversation with a friend or a neighbor or even family. Between March 1933 and June of 1944, Roosevelt recorded 31 evening radio addresses. He talked about things that were about the survival of the country. And he talked about the things that were survival of the people of the country things such as the banking system that had crashed, the recovery program for things like social security. There were things that were anything that was important to people to help relieve some of their anxiety. During the depression, as I'd mentioned before, radio was the medium that was useful for, for, especially for diversion and withdrawal. If you think back to the uses and gratifications theory, there was upbeat shows like the Lone Ranger, as well as daytime soap operas that were very popular. Radio did well during World War II as there was a shortage of newsprint. So people turned to the radio for their news. Edward Morrow, who is a well-known journalist, actually broadcasted live during the Blitz of London. The radio became the place where people would go to find their news. 
How do we define radio? Well, we can pretty much take it anywhere we want to go because they're radio radio waves. They're in the air. They're there when I, whenever we want to use them. They're supplemental. We usually listen to the radio when we're doing something else. Most probably, most common today would probably be when you're in the car. It's not your prime focus. It's more of a backup noise. It's universal. Most homes have some type of radio and most cars also have a radio. About 70% of Americans listen to the radio every day, according to Statistica. It has a very niche target audience. Stations choose formats that will attack a small, narrowly defined audience because that's attractive to specific advertisers. Here is an illustration that shows you the electromagnetic spectrum. FM radio short wavelength, high frequency, AM radio, long wavelength, low frequency are all shown here. Radio had a lot of impact on American culture. However, some radio programs eventually moved to television and that took over what was the most popular home-based mass medium. So the radio turned their focus to music. They added specialized programming such as things like the top 40 hits and they did those for various genres. So you'd have the pop top 40, you'd have country top 40, things like that. Stations built programs around specific personalities, and I'll talk about this in a few slides ahead here. Some stations were definitely very targeted to specific demographics, and you still see that today very much so. Public radio stations began to thrive, but they were hit really hard in the mid 80s. FM didn't do as well as expected as it had to compete with the beginning days of television. The emergence of television, which was about 1948, was very evident as TV would take over as the mass medium of choice for entertainment. So radio had to change its format and content, economics and functions. As far as economics, they had to sell more ads for local businesses and for content, they had more music, talk and news. By 1960, all evening radio shows and daytime serials had ended. Network service became two to three hours each day of news and short features, which allowed individual stations to develop their own personality with a distinct appeal to a certain segment of the audience. Top 40 started in the Midwest when a station monitored the top selling records and sheet music and sorted out the tunes that were selling the most. Stations began to develop their own formats of music based on genre, especially country, rock, and classical. This slide talks more about the technological development, how it moved from a wireless technology used to communicate to one far more for entertainment. NPR and PBS mandated to provide alternatives to commercial broadcasting. NPR draws about 27 million listeners each week to popular news shows and interview programs. Their funding comes from private donations and corporate sponsorships. Mind you, they do not have any advertising. In the, between the 1950s and the 1980s, the FCC tried to encourage diversity in broadcast ownership as well as programming by limiting the number of stations a media company could own. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 eliminated most of those limitations. This meant a lot of corporate conversions. Today, Clear Channel Communications, or CCC, and CBS Radio control about a quarter of the entire radio industry's revenue, which is about $18 billion. Paul Harvey first came on the air back in the early 1950s. His unique voice and style captured the attention of millions of Americans who would turn daily to his show. Some of those fans stuck through well into the 21st centuries. He told stories about the unsung heroes, ordinary people doing amazing things. In the 1970s and 1980s, AM radio was going the way of the dinosaurs because people were moving to FM radio to listen to music. But in the 90s, both conservative and liberal AM radio hosts were gaining popularity and drawing huge audiences, like in the millions. They took on a variety of controversial topics. 
Dr. Laura Schlesinger, was a social conservative who talked about morals and the battle between right and wrong. She burst onto the airwaves in the mid-90s and quickly became the most listened to radio show. She defined her style as, quote, no-nonsense advice infused with a strong sense of ethics, accountability, and personal responsibility, unquote. Both Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity started an AM talk show radio and today are listed as the top two radio hosts in America. And it's now presented by Premier Networks to about 13 and a half million listeners. This was back in 2018. I haven't checked these recently. But these two were very much loved for their outgoing expression of political conservatives. On the other side of the coin, we have the very liberal Howard Stern. He was known as a shock jock. He did all he could to walk the tightrope of censorship, seeing how close he could get before the FCC would breathe down his neck or even shut him down. Many of these hosts are now syndicated internationally and still broadcast on satellite radio and internet radio. HD digital radio quality signal was purchased as a special set so it struggled even though there were over 1,700 stations broadcasting in HD by 2010. Satellite radio also developed financial difficulties, and you don't see it very much anymore. I have it in my car, but I don't subscribe to it because it's easier for me to just stream off my phone off Spotify. Internet radio emerged in the 90s with the popularity of the web. There were two types that allowed traditional stations to reach the audience beyond its borders, but copyright issues often came into play. Pandora was the most popular. that They had about 125 million users at one time. Then iHeartRadio helped put more than 850 radio stations across the United States as a free streaming service. Both allowed users to create their own playlists. Then we moved down to apps and mobile radio generated content, podcasting, social media, radio, and these all embraced marketing. As we wind down here, I'm just going to speak briefly about podcasting because I'll talk more about that when I talk about digital entertainment. Podcast files are audio files that can be downloaded as well as streamed live. You can also find them on YouTube. Podcasts don't fit the traditional radio play concept. Many say that they're a precursor to how radio will continue to evolve. In 2014, there was a series called This American Life that launched the radio serial, which became hugely popular. True crime, technology, and celebrity influencers dominate today's market. And our last slide just shows you some data here. You can read this and consume this on your own. This is Marian Schultz signing off.